good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for another one of our uh, Publics at IHS series. Today we have an exciting lineup and an exciting conversation lined up. Uh, this is based on a special feature curated for the City Journal uh, titled The Structural Violence of Spatial Transformation and the More Than Neoliberal State in the Global South. Uh, this issue has been curated by uh, Himanshu Pote of the Center of Urban Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay and Professor Lali Bakamut at the Center for Urban Policy and Governance at Des Mumbai, who will be uh, moderating today's panel discussion. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Lalita and Mahanshu. First of all, um, just want to extend a warm thanks to the IIHS team for inviting us here. Uh, we're really delighted, in fact, um, to talk a little bit about the special feature that just came out in April of this year. Um, in the City Journal. Um, so what we're going to do today is, in fact, uh, Himanshu and I will, in fact, take you through um, a little bit of the special feature. We will set up this concept of structural violence, um, which I know for many people is an abstract term. We'll do our best to uh, discuss how we actually struggled with it and, in fact, found it quite enriching as a concept. Um, I want to begin, in fact, um, by talking about the tremendous urban transformations that we encounter every day um, in our urban spaces. Cities in the global south are undergoing significant spatial transformations. We see kilometers of new roads being built, constant development or redevelopment, whether it's of malls or markets. The domains of land and real estate are increasingly central to this restructuring. Overall, we see the prioritization of mega projects and infrastructural development, rather, in fact, than industrial development. And this is something quite familiar to us. And the way in which this project, these projects are advanced is by a mode of governance that merges elite, public, and private actors in producing the city and city space. Thinking from these sites, from these processes, we realize that frames like worlding, concepts of world-classing, don't do justice to understand the harm that is inherent in these transformations. Um, and so this search, in fact, led us uh, to explore the concept of structural violence. Um, I want to take a few minutes to actually talk about the concept of structural violence, particularly focusing on its relevance to urban studies and specifically to urban transformations that we see all around us. Structural violence, uh, in fact, has a fairly long conceptual history. Uh, it has origins in peace studies. Um, and in fact, um, in 1969, Galtung talks about, he defines structural violence as the violence built into structures that shows up as unequal power and consequently as unequal life chances. He goes on to further argue that structural violence is because it is built into systems, into the system, it might not have identifiable actors. In fact, all of us are complicit. Uh, and neither is it always intentional or knowingly enacted. Therefore, it is best studied from its outcomes. And in fact, this work from peace studies then migrated to medical anthropology, where Paul Farmer, in fact, focused on understanding structural violence in terms of its contribution to human suffering. From there, we actually traced its recent extensions into urban studies, quite a diverse and enriching literature. There are four strands that I want to particularly highlight that we found very useful to think through then what violence actually means and particularly its structural nature. The first is infrastructural violence. And this is really violence, uh, talking about how structural forms of violence in fact flow through the very material infrastructure that we see every day, whether it's pipes or um, bridges or whatever. And social suffering, similarly, is often experienced in material terms. And this is a, has led to a very vast and productive literature. Uh, many case studies have been written, many theoretical pieces across cities of both Global North and Global South. The second literature that we have found useful to think about is the literature on slow violence. Now, this literature, in fact, was coined by Rob Nixon from coming from environmental humanities. He talked about this idea of 
how violence that is incremental, that is accretive, that is in fact very little visible, how in fact this it sort of results in this idea of the delayed destruction, um, the sort of long dines, a very evocative terms he uses to talk about environmental catastrophes that are spread across space and time. Um, this idea of slow violence has in fact been usefully taken into the fields of housing dispossession, renewal, gentrification, and scholars have talked about in fact the collective urban trauma that results from uh, processes by which people are slowly dispossessed. For example, the decay of social housing. And this is not just the physical effects of this decay, but the psychological effects associated with such wounding. Um, other scholars have talked about the racialized nature of this process um, or herbicide or anti-Black geographical violence talking about. And this is again, largely coming from the global North. A third strand of literature that is useful is that of the everyday state or bureaucratic violence. And this is violence that we see that is caused by institutional administration that normalizes suffering. And this is done either by withholding services or by not enforcing safety and health standards. So this is a very routinized sort of everyday way in which uh, deep structural violence is meted out. The fourth and final strand that I want to share with you today that we found useful was is rather a loose grouping of literatures on state-led world-classing projects, state-led informality, and flexible planning. And while these haven't conventionally been theorized as implicated in structural violence, as we will, as you will see as we go through this panel discussion, uh, they're quite useful in thinking through how structural violence is in fact embedded in the very structures of social, political, um, economic, and cultural life. Um, Reading these literatures, in fact, helped Himanshu and I as co-editors of this special feature. It helped us to clarify, in fact, the utility of using structural violence as a lens. It also helped us to understand how we wanted to use this concept to distinguish it from earlier works. And there are three things that I want to note here, which are very useful when um, uh, focusing on the, when thinking about how to use um, structural violence as a lens. Uh, the first is really that most people, when we talk about violence, the first thing that comes to mind is really physical interpersonal violence and the violence and the um, episodic or eventful nature of it. But structural violence, in fact, departs from this. It does not look at physical interpersonal violence. Rather, it actually looks at the structural roots of violence and traces it to its broader urban and social nature. And so this is really the departure that we uh, signal in this work. This does not mean that structural violence does the replaces or diminishes the significance of direct violence. In fact, it often leads to direct violence, uh, but we want to highlight how it has a complex relation with violence and Himanshu will in fact show this uh, as we move forward. The second point I want to make here is really that all the papers in the collection highlight the violence in fact of the democratic state. Um, and this is again something of importance because a lot of this literature on structural violence that we read seems to be embedded in the actions of authoritarian states on the one hand or those undergoing political transition. But we in fact depart from that to look in this collection at how democratic states in fact inflict structural violence um, on their own citizens. The third point I want to raise about uh, the ways in which we've um, thought through using structural violence as a lens is that we in fact have shifted from reading structural violence purely as deprivation arising out of poverty and inequality. And this is something, again, a lot of the literature, particularly if you look at uh, the way Galtung conceptualized structural violence or the way Farmer talked about suffering, a lot of it is tied to notions of poverty um, and subsequently also inequality. But we in fact tie it very explicitly to the project of spatial transformation that our cities are undergoing um, to actually talk, read structural violence as very much implicated in this process. Focusing on systemic violence overall has enriched our thinking about the social spatial production of suffering. It has also helped us to think through possible pathways toward less structurally violent cities. And here we want, I want to just leave you with the thought that this is really 
in some ways an explicit challenge to liberal notions and liberal visions of responsibility and redress that focus only on the individual-led solutions. I'll just spend now maybe one minute on telling you a little bit about the process that we under underwent for doing this uh, special feature. Um, the, the special feature and this interest in structural violence began in 2013 when we embarked on a three-year collaborative, multi-sited South-South project. Uh, it was located in three cities in the Global South, um, uh, uh, Durban, Mumbai, and Rio de Janeiro. Um, and this project was amazing because it enabled cross-fertilization of concepts, of languages, of literatures across very different colonial to neoliberal histories. Um, this project was, as I said, a three-year project. We had a number of different discussions, uh, intense arguments and conflicts about how do we think through this concept of structural violence? Is it useful? What? How do we bound it? Um, we finally then in 2019, uh, did an open call um, at the RC21 uh, conference. And this open call resulted in the Ankara team uh, of Mustafa, Seth, and Mehmet to actually write in and send us such a brilliant paper that uh, we were so excited to include it then in the special feature. And the addition of Ankara to the other uh, uh, four cities enriches the comparison by illuminating spatial transformations in a different field than that of the other societies that have undergone colonization by Western powers, um, that of an imperial Islamic society. And so Ankara added that uh, additional element to the already rich field of comparison um, that we were very happy to develop further. I'm going to stop here and request my co-editor, uh, colleague and friend Himanshu to take over. Thank you, Larita. Um, so I'll speak a bit about um, how uh, the, uh, the concept of structural violence has played out in this collection. Um, there are two levels at which I will do this. One is to speak of uh, three uh, of a triad of um, uh, phenomena that kind of hover over and organize uh, the story um, in each of these four cities that uh, that are represented in this uh, special feature, a, a key uh, a key mechanism or uh, kind of underlying force that we see uh, in these cities is a kind of interconnected lethality of uh, uh, in spatial restructuring of two of very you know two opposed. Uh, or contrasting modes. One is what has been called uh, state killing, or more, more uh, simply, you know, more spectacular form of violence. And the on the other end, the uh, idea of letting die, which corresponds to a more slow uh, unfolding of violence that is experienced. And we see that what is interesting is we see both of these ends a as being connected, which means that. The processes by which, uh, through, for instance, neglect or through the stalling of uh, redevelopment in in Kamatipura and Mumbai, lead there can be uh, there are actually uh, outcomes which ultimately end in more spectacular uh, deaths, for instance, or or the possibility of deaths. And in in other on the other end in Rio, for instance, you you find that a certain um, mix of of uh, acting on in a very uh, acting on a small population to displace them for a proposed Olympics, acting on them through planning, which seems like a relatively uh, quiet way of uh, pushing down, uh, leads also to other kinds of more direct violence, both by the state as well as. Uh, coming out of the frustrations uh, from the people who are, uh, in in this case, say, repressed, oppressed. There's also a uh, one of the forces behind this, which we clearly address and 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 kind of hold to account, is the state. And in these papers, it is what has been called the more than neoliberal state. 
Um, and this state, as Lalita mentioned earlier, is a democratic state, which makes it much more, uh, I think, which makes it more consequential to, to name it as involved in, in a project of violence. And it's not purely neoliberal, as we know, uh, the way, uh, if there is a, at all something like the purely neoliberal state, uh, even in the West, but it's a state which is engaged in uh, in various kinds of deal making, various kinds of alliances uh, with private actors, not necessarily the market. It's in, in the Indian case, it's been uh, talked of as a pro business uh, state rather than pro market state. And this this axis is one of the uh, uh, is a very important player behind the initiatives that result in the spatial transformation and also mobilize a certain kind of uh, structural violence. And finally, as, as mentioned right at the outset, as Larita said, we, especially for, for this special feature, we focused on the, the violence that is coded into space as an outcome in different ways. Um, and Spatial transformation then also becomes a, a very useful, a very revealing research object through which we begin to see this hidden order of structural violence because structural violence is not automatically visible and uh, spatial transformation then offers one useful research object uh, through which to then begin to trace its contours. Across uh, the four cities, we thus found a few similarities. And um, one of them is the interplay of uh, slow and spectacular violence. In the case of, uh, say, the early mo early morning market in uh, the the Warwick Triangle in in Durban, uh, as well as in the evictions and demolitions for building the Olympic City in Rio, as I mentioned earlier with Rio, there is this uh, playing out of a certain longer process in which we could argue even, even the, um, the threat of being displaced uh, is, is a form of violence. And that leads to actually much more explicit, uh, explicitly violent, even direct, directly physically violent moments. There is, on the other hand, this, the, the uncertainty and the sense of being under siege is revealed also in a in in Kamatipura, for instance, as a kind of slow violence of just speculative waiting, and the speculation here is uh, or the speculative waiting here also begins to reveal the contradictory nature of uh, of uh, the response of those who are kind of affected or implicated in that violence. On the one hand, hoping to uh, find some value out of uh, the possibilities inherent in this uncertainty, in this case through, uh, through redevelopment, for instance, and on the other also uh, resisting that in different ways. There's also the uh, one, one mechanism which uh, is common through which harm really is, is visited is the various kinds of uh, bureaucratic forms and processes and this would uh, this would involve both the operation of uh, these bureaucracies whether they are the planning bureaucracies that take ultimately uh, through policy and uh, legislation take on a kind of regime character as we'll see in the two presentations today or they uh, they can begin to cause harm through various kinds of subversion of already existing more um, uh, more emancipatory arrangements for instance uh, the participatory the process of participatory planning in uh, durban which was kept aside and subverted uh, to bring in a, a more a more than neoliberal project of redeveloping uh, the market and these bureaucracies of harm are also visible uh, there uh, in Rio, where uh, 
as I discussed earlier, the you know planning and policy and legal frameworks are actively used to displace an already marginalized community only because, uh, or perhaps with the pretext of an Olympic uh, city being built on the venue. And finally, we, we find that there is an entrenchment across the four cities of violent, of structurally violent and sometimes directly violent city level regimes. And this is uh, very interesting that it is, it is a kind of scaled up enactment of structural violence, sometimes through a single policy, uh, sometimes through its interplay, but which acts in a, in a selective way on particular neighborhoods. Um, and this is particularly uh, strong in, in uh, uh, in the paper on uh, Amita's paper, which will, she will present, as well as in the in the paper on Ankara. So in this panel, we basically focus on uh, the question of the structural violence that that is uh, mobilized through the formation of uh, specific spatial spatial transformation regimes across Mumbai and Ankara. So I'll I'll uh, stop now with a quick introduction to the speakers. Um, you will you already have a very uh, uh, there are affiliations or out there on the chat. Uh, will we have two papers being presented by by the uh, authors? The first paper is by first presentation would be by uh, the Ankara team, basically Mustafa Bayerbag. Uh, Mehmet Pempesit Sholu uh, and Seth Schindler. Uh, Mustafa is uh, with the Middle East Technical University and the, Depart and the Department of Political Science and Administration. Mehmet is the Pamukkale University and the Department of City and Regional Planning. And Seth is with the University of Manchester. Amita is at the uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences with the School of Habitat Studies. So I'll now request our uh, uh, the Ankara team to uh, make their presentation first uh, in 10 minutes, and then we'll move on to Amita, after which we'll have another round of uh, uh, very short reflections by both panelists. Thank you. So over to you, Mustafa and Nedan. Okay, I think you can hear me, right? Yes. Excellent. So I'm just going to share our presentation and I'll be really building up on uh, what Lalita and Himanshu uh, discussed. And we will try to share the key fi like findings and what we found there, but we will be like a rather analytical conclusions. Uh, so we're not going to discuss the empirical details, but uh, here uh, what is important uh, is that like how we also we, we will discuss we will begin our discussion with how we engage with this concept of uh, structural violence first. Then we will later on discuss uh, what sort of mechanisms we observe where this structural violence is manifested or being operationalized. Okay, let me just share our presentation. There we go. Okay, I think now you can all see it, right? So we are Team Ankara, uh, needless to say. Uh, so here, I would like to draw your attention to the concept of the urban politics of hope. Well, well, well we talk about, right, uh, violence as a, as a traumatic event or as to create, right, uh, trauma and, right, has a psychological burden on humans. But how would that just come together with the notion of hope? Well, this is precisely our point. Well, this politics of hope is the way to enlist or draft the victims into a game where uh, we wish would serve sort of a, like a Ponzi mechanism. Well, the, well, I mean, our departure point was roughly that, like, how could we explain the popularity of a political movement or regime uh, or government in the case of Turkey, right, where 
whose urbanization agenda proved to be very quite costly and harmful on many grounds. And I will give you examples later. But and which ultimately developed an authoritarian approach to its governance in particular, right? So how come and Justin Development Party, right, has been in power for uh, like around more than two decades. But if we stretch it back to the, the, the initial beginnings of the Justin and Development Party in its roots in, in local government practice, like more than like almost like three decades now. Because Mr. Erdogan served as the mayor of Istanbul. And around the same time, Mr. Melik Kökçek of Ankara came to the office. So our story like is, a, is a, like a spans across like three decades. But in the last two decades, it, it took a national political form and began to control the central government. So how come, despite all the crises, many economic crises, political crises, the Justin Dalton Party remained in power thanks to its urbanization agenda? So we argue that the Justin Dalton Party or the AKP uh, has been pursuing a hegemonic project. And this hegemonic project has been uh, constructed around, quote unquote, an imperial mode of living, to quote the, 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 the uh, to borrow from the, from Brandon Wilson, which is, which is a culturally brewed norms of production and consumption, where Justin Dalton Party spoke to the uh, wishes and dreams and hopes of previously excluded marginalized sections of society and to draft them into the wealth and welfare distribution mechanism of the Republic of Turkey, right? And this imperial mode of living, as we will discuss, had like uh, point the finger at a series of hopes of making the lives better. And that like that hope would come soon, right? They were not the politicians, the leaders of the AKP, starting with Mr. Erdogan, was not talking about some really uh, future hope, but hope to be delivered today, right? It would be a fast or, or quickly delivered hope, not being postponed to future, really. But that imperial mode of living uh, had two elements. One of them was that of redistribution, and the other one was recognition. In other words, not only the redistribution of wealth, and creation and redistribution of wealth, which would take place via urbanization, but also some politics of recognition would, would be entailed here. By recognition, we mean not only uh, the recognition of the conservative uh, identity of the urban poor, but also their recognition as first-class urban citizens. And the key or the gateway to first class urban citizenship would be via property ownership, right? So that was your, your title deed would prove that you would be a good citizen, regardless of your identity or your conservative background, so on and so forth. Well, if you are to build a hegemonic project, you need to work via both coercion and consent, right? Well, the coercion apparently uh, requires the active use of physical brute violence, spectacular violence, but which would be legitimate in the right, if you follow Weber. But the latter consent would be established via structural violence, as Galton emphasizes, right? As Lalit and Himansh explained, right? So structural violence would, would facilitate building up consent or building up consent would incorporate, involve structural violence. And in fact, it's via the latter that the hegemonic projects are established and become sustainable. In other words, thanks to the structural violence components uh, of the AKP's urbanization project, that it turned into a sustainable exercise in, in political uh, regime. Well, in fact, it, it, we ended our paper with a question mark that what would happen in the, in the following May elections? And they won the elections again. And, the, and we will later see uh, this huge earthquake that flattened one of the biggest uh, urbanized zones and regions in Turkey, right? Somehow like contributed towards that purpose. And we will discuss that later too, right? But it became sustainable. So 
I mean, here we are uh, benefiting from Galton's uh, definition of uh, violent structural violence, but here we refer to his emphasis on the cause of difference between the potential and the actual, right? In other words, there is a there is a potential, and but then there is the actual, meaning that there might be an actual benefit to stream down from an urbanization effort, but it is it it is distributed to the extent that it really pays less than uh, you would expect to get at the end of the day. Or let me put it another way. So you will be paid, you will be paid, you will get some benefits today, but to the cost of some, but, but with some future cost, that will later prove to be a very costly enterprise on your part, right? And well, he goes, right, if insight and or resources are monopolized by a group or class or are used for other purposes, then the actual level falls behind the potential level and violence is present in the system. Then, well, that difference represents the degree of social injustice in a given society, right? And this distribution, unequal distribution of insight and resources, which are determined by authorities, typically the state, with the power to decide, regulate, and distribute. So in other words, the decisions of regulate, regulatory decisions, distributive decisions of governments, including local authorities, they do create or they do operationalize structural violence. So then what are we talking about when we use the term distribution or redistribution? We are apparently referring to the benefits, distribution of benefits and costs of urbanization, such that certain benefits are diffused, but then also focused. And costs are diffused, but they're also focused. In other words, benefits are concentrated to certain sections of society where the costs are diffused to the broader publics or benefits focused to the current moment, to the current year or current decade, while the costs are postponed to the next or following decades, to the next generations, right? And while certain costs are postponed, the process is also being speeded up, right? So the way in which we engage with the notion of structural violence is a bit different than that of uh, Nixon's, right? There the slow violence is, is about allowing the system or the people or the nature to die. Here, the state is active, is not allowing things to happen, but is actively shaping things to unfold, right? And it's not taking place slowly. In the case of Tur Turkey, Turkey, it's faster, it's speeding up. Here, structural violence comes in a fast form. And here is the, the hope is the elements that the concept you find very useful to, to further unfold the notion of structural violence, right? As an element of structural violence. Here, violence becomes attractive or luring. So it's an inclusive urbanization. Well, inclusion doesn't mean a necessarily socially just agenda, police agenda, right? We, in the case of Turkey, we have had an inclusive urbanization setting, meaning that as long as you, you, you own a piece of land, you can join the game, right? It's inclusive, but it's inclusive only for the title deed holders or those who can pay for who, who can who, who can pay for housing, right? So it's inclusive, but the lines are drawn very like uh, strictly. And that's where you can no longer afford to pay, right? And this inclusive urbanization is also like motivated by politics of hope, imperial mode of living, all those shiny shopping malls, right? Brand new housing like suburbia, right? Build renovated houses, apartments. So this way of living also kind of a triggered and motivated ordinary citizens to join in the game, right? And here, this is where we begin to also see how hope kind of creates or enlist the victims into the game, right? So we caught here winter, right? Tracing the roots of one back to Greek tragedy, right? So violence here, and this is we think that we have that our case would contribute, is not the product of a single perpetrator, 
it's not necessarily an evil agenda of a single uh, policymaker. In fact, everyone is part of the game, right? There's a shared curse where the um, the victor and the vanquished, the captor and the captive, they're all part of the game. So it's a, like a, it's presented as a win-win scenario, but it ends up as a lose-lose scenario, right? This is the nature of right policy schemes, anyhow. So apparently, the aim of this whole urbanization agenda of Justin and Open Party was to fabricate, fabricate a political institutional scheme that would require the participation of the victims and that would have a new moral basis, right? So structural violence has a moral basis too. So that, uh, I will go with this last one here in the uh, presentation, the last uh, bullet point. So we had a very carefully fabricated moral consensus in the case of Turkey that championed the shortcuts to wealth. So there has been a cultural transformation too, right? Championed the shortcuts to wealth. I mean, in the social media too, you will find the examples in Turkey, right? Encouraged speculation by portraying urban land and rent as the primary source of wealth, not like by being employed, not doing investments, not being like uh, innovation, but just by a piece of land or house. That's the best, wisest, smartest investment, right? So encourage, engage in speculative activity. The third one is establish a flexible set of official rules, like playing into uncertainty and ambiguity, right? And finally, uphold the logic of market entrepreneurship and competition. So everyone turned into an entrepreneur. Here, the, 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 the magic of the scheme was to turn the ordinary citizen into an entrepreneur, a player in the market. And here the, uh, here the uh, sorry, the social composition of those victims would be like, or the participants, at least those who demanded for that sort of an urbanization too, would be the urban middle class, the first generation, Gecekondu settlers, Gecekondu meaning the informal housing or, or like occupants of the urban, the public owned land. Then the first generation, again, Gecekondu settlers with lower bargaining power. In other words, their lands were not that big, right? So that they would not be able to enter the market easily. And there would come the tenants, their tenants, right? Those first three groups were drafted, lured into this lucrative scheme in the short run. And the last two, however, paid the burden, right? Meaning about the 60% of the society. And today in, in Ankara and Turkey, we end, end up, ended up with a housing shortage crisis in the midst of all that extra housing production. And I'm not going to talk about that right now but in the second round, right? And the agents of this whole scheme, like we can trace it back to the, the mayor of Ankara Metropolitan Municipality who ruled Ankara from 1994 to 2007 for 23 years, right? But uh, he has been like the equivalent of Mr. Almost Erdogan within the, the rank of the movement that started just an open party almost. But he was almost quote unquote the second figure or the second name after Mr. Erdogan. But Mr. Erdogan as the mayor of Ankara, he also served as the leader of the whole movement. But as the mayor of Ankara, Mr. Uh, Gökçek, he was busy establishing this urban regime. And the funny thing is, he ultimately uh, managed to upscale this whole regime that he fabricated, urban transformation regime in Ankara, and turned it into a national one. And if you Google it and write Gökçek Yasası, Gökçek Law in Turkish, you will come up with all those laws on urban transformation. And half, at least half a dozen of them. He was actually lobbied for those laws and passed and made all those legal amendments himself personally uh, check that but the, here the key agents were come sorry again. hello hello mustafa we are at yes uh, so can you wind up oh yeah, yeah sure sure we are okay. almost there so it was mr uh Gökçek, then the the akp's local branch and other local politicians construction companies urban planning bureaucracy intermediaries ordinary public human entrepreneurs uh, so on and so forth. So they were part of the game. So uh, so Mr. Uh, the, 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 the 
the, the strategy was to include as many people and areas as possible into the transformation enterprise, meaning that play at the periphery of the uh, city, not only in the downtown. And to keep the planning process as patchy and uh, flexible as possible, and to mediate the transaction between the landowners and the developers. So the mayor or the municipal people or the party branch officials would join in the deals, right? So that's all uh, that I have to say for the moment on behalf of Team Ankara. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa, um, for a very, very succinct and but very uh, comprehensive uh, account of a complex paper. So I'll now invite uh, Amita to tell us the Mumbai story. Thank you so much, Himanshu Lalita and IIHS. Uh, I think uh, what Mustafa has done in some ways is set up a very interesting background for the Mumbai story itself, right? Because you will see that there are a lot of continuities, lots of overlaps. What is popularly known as a scheme, the slum redevelopment policy in Mumbai, I argue in the paper that the slum redevelopment has no longer remained a policy in Mumbai, but after more than 30, it was introduced in 1991 as an experiment for the first time. So now it is more than 32 years since it has been uh, introduced. It has almost become a regime. And uh, uh, there are several articles, several papers, several studies which have been done on the slum redevelopment scheme. The way in which most papers try to analyze the slum redevelopment scheme is to basically understand it by its objectives, which are to provide uh, housing to slum dwellers, to rehabilitate slum dwellers, ex-slum dwellers, and convert them into formal property holders in the form of a 225 square feet or now increasingly moving up to a 400 square feet tenement. We also see that actually this Mumbai model of slum redevelopment is being exported now to several other cities in India. Delhi, Ahmedabad, Bangalore has experimented with this. Telangana has some experiments in the form of two-bedroom housing. Uh, and we also have other cities in Maharashtra like Pune, Thane, uh, Nagpur, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is the overall backdrop. Now, why do I not treat this as a scheme? What, what is the need to basically talk about this like a regime? And I think that is really the key element. Uh, I really argue that the several of the constitutive elements of this entire scheme, elements such as state predation, the speculation and using the state predation and speculation as instruments to deliver public goods like social, uh, like housing and other social amenities, the elements like the immense generation of wealth and the possibilities of accumulation that it has given rise to, this is some which cannot be captured by a conventional policy analysis. Because as slum redevelopment has moved through multiple phases, and in the paper, I really talk about four phases by which through which this entire regime has developed. Uh, in 1991, it was only in as an experiment to eat us. If you look at the actors around that time, these were primarily NGOs. And there were the state housing department was constantly, uh, you see the first institution of the scheme in the form of what is called the 40 lakh free housing scheme. And since then, in from 1995 to uh, uh, basically 2023 24 one is seeing a constant escalation and deepening of the team. 
to the extent that currently slum redevelopment projects have become extremely large. Uh, they have reached heights of verticality, which one can only uh, imagine. Uh, and much more importantly, more than the entire physical and the socio-spatial transformations that they have led to are extremely violent. Because what this means, on one hand, it has changed the entire power dynamics between uh, the laboring poor on one hand and the city's powerful elements on the other hand. Today, uh, if you look at uh, what is a settlement, the agency, the voice of occupying, resisting, improving and creating a place in the city have completely given way to a, a what should I say, a politics of peripheralization, multiple levels, uh, material level, representational levels, symbolic level, and at the level of discourse itself. And which is why one needs to think about uh, structural violence as a concept, which is really uh, something which is very strongly applicable to this case of slum redevelopment. Uh, one will see that there are at least six to seven different facets of the structural violence, and I'm going to just briefly mention them. So one of these is what happens to the process itself of slum redevelopment. And overall, one sees that consent, which was seen to be that form by which people participate into these schemes. And previously, at the beginning of the scheme, uh, consent was placed at something like 70% of people within a particular settlement had to agree uh, before a scheme could be formulated and a project could be submitted to the slum redevelopment authority, which was created. Subsequently, however, this has given way to a form of consent where schemes can be merged, their boundaries can be shifted, and therefore the ratio of this 70% began to become an extremely manipulable ratio, and which leads to all kind of fraudulent practices uh, that may be seen. And at the current level, even that 70% is seen to be problematic. And therefore, there are projects where either the overall consent is reduced to first of all saying you will not consent to a particular formulation or to a particular developer promoted scheme, but you will basically just give your consent to either becoming part of a slum redevelopment or no. So it has become and become reduced to a yes or no. The proportions have become reduced to less than 50%. Not just that, but if you look at the escalation to current schemes, like the Dharavi redevelopment project, I have not discussed that in the paper, but you will see that the consent clause has been done away with altogether. So I think this is one facet of the kind of violence that I'm talking about. The second kind of violence is a complete... Uh, abdication say of the state and this is really talking about violences done to people who are part of slum redevelopment projects okay uh, what does abdication by the state mean if once you are part of a slum redevelopment scheme it is just assumed he, when you get converted or transformed into formal housing there is no need you also become economically well off because there is an asset that you begin to own. And this asset may be, have its worth in lakhs of rupees. Okay? So therefore, you don't remain poor. And therefore, there is very little investment in other kinds of uh, schemes or other kinds of projects, like those linked to food security or health subsidies and so on and so forth. The second element of this abdication of state uh, really pertains just to the way in which the slum redevelopment schemes are conducted, which are totally become developer-led. So the state cannot facilitate or does not facilitate any petitions, any uh, arguments which come from the local residents at all, 
rather most of it is tilted towards the developers in fact i know of several housing rights activists who have constantly been pressurized there are many other interpersonal violences which have been committed in relation to them so in some ways the state does not come across as a protector uh, or a intervener in the case of slum residents but instead clearly creates much more facilitative steps for developers and therefore it also becomes a case of much more than neoliberalism a third facet i think that one should begin to see then is what happens to the rest of the uh, uh, settlements where there are no slum redevelopment projects as of now i would argue here that slum redevelopment has changed the very processes by which today settlements are made and unmade in mumbai because a it has increased and enhanced the level of speculation available uh, which is existing even in slum properties because today marginal lands have got linked to uh, the formal uh, property prices in some ways they have got indexed there and therefore even the costs of uh, hutments or rent of hutments which have very few facilities which offer very little security is also sky high uh, like for example in areas like ville parle a single hut of 10 by 10 square feet will easily cost you something in the range of 14 to 15 lakhs uh i'll come to uh, so there are these practices also the way in which organization and mobilization of slum dwellers takes place and uh, right till the 1970s 80s mumbai used to have extremely strong housing rights struggle but these narratives today have really given way to everything that is builder sponsored so you see festivals which are no longer community festivals but these become developer sponsored festivals developers also take people in order to uh, bring in their consent to different religious festivals and places and picnics there are kinds of gifts which are given on and simultaneously there are other ways in which coercion also occurs simultaneously uh i think besides these practices in the state one will see ki at a larger level at a city level there are two primary impacts which i will talk about and then i'll stop so one is the way in which uh, colonization uh, of slum settlements occur at the beginning of slum redevelopment schemes somewhere around 8% of the city's land was occupied by informal settlements today if you will begin to analyze project by project more than 30% uh, i would say more than 66% of the land in every slum redevelopment project is really occupied by the for profit component or is converted into a tdr and the rehabilitation buildings are crunched onto less than one third of the overall land i would actually argue that this is a form of colonization of the entire settlements which happens one will also see that the larger restructuring of the geography of the city where today informal settlements from being spread everywhere in the city and especially in its central area are getting pushed to the margins of the city and especially in the poorer margins like the m east ward or the p north ward the r south ward which are really located to the north or the east uh, of the city and finally i would say that the kind of structural violence that we are talking about also results in a shift in the overall discourse linked to settling and occupying where courts middle class people uh, media everyone begins to project the overall narrative of settlement as a not only illegal act but something which there is a extra favoritism which is done to the slum dwellers uh, in fact very recently again something which has not been covered in my paper uh, but i've referred to another judgment but one recent judgment is being that 
the Bombay High Court remarks that it is only slum dwellers who have the privilege of getting a free house. Other victims and other middle class taxpayers are not entitled to these kind of favoritisms by the state. So it creates a tremendous alienation between the informal settlers and the rest of the city. I'm going to stop here. And this is just illustrative of the several kinds of harms which are actually ha happening via the slum redevelopment scheme as it intensifies. Okay? And today, therefore, the scheme, as I said, is a regime. There are several kinds of political uh, governments which have ruled the state in the last uh, 30 years, but there has been no change. There is no evaluation. There is no review of this scheme because it is something on which uh, the entire political economy of the state and the city is perpetuated. Thank you. Thank you, Amita. Uh, again, for a very, very thought-provoking uh, synopsis of uh, your paper. Um, as planned, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we are behind time. We are actually uh, used up more time than we had planned. So we'll have a second round of reflections by the authors, uh, starting with Amita, but it, it would be great if you can keep them, uh, keep it to about two minutes. And the uh, the question now, drawing from the very grounded, city-specific insights that that you have presented, what what do you see as the potential of this broader concept of structural violence coming from you know, Mumbai or Ankara? What do you see its potential in uh, in terms of engaging other uh, broader uh, issues to do, especially with urban and, and spatial, uh, social spatial transformation. So I'll, uh, Amita, you can go first, uh, just a couple of minutes, and then um, Mustafa or the team Ankara, in fact, the others are all here now. Um, and then we'll open it out uh, to questions, we, which we are uh, eagerly waiting for uh, in the chat box. Yeah, please, I was going to say, request those in the audience to please type in their questions into the chat box. Thanks. Okay, so I'll just talk of two uh, things uh, quickly within the time which is available. Uh, and I think one potential of looking through a structural violence angle is, some, is something which is linked to the local uh, overall politics, uh, which is linked to land and housing and people's claims. And there, I think the, there is a increasing uh, distancing of the state and there is an utter silence which is being created amongst the uh, uh, housing rights activists as well as strugglers, where everything that comes and the more uh, distancing that happens, uh, so you don't protest. Uh, there are no specific uh, actions which result in even saying that, hey, we don't want X, but Y is something that we desire. We desire upgradation. We desire better social amenities. We want good infrastructure. We don't want to be dumped into particular sites altogether with reduced housing standards that we are contributing to the city. So I think pushing this kind of an alternative narrative is one of the functions, I think, that the structural violence gives you that kind of a space to even begin to argue for a more uh, just and a more peace-linked kind of a movement. The second, I think, uh, uh, value of bringing in the structural violence angle is to actually begin to think of uh, even conceptually uh, and think of really power as a very important element uh, which is used disproportionately 
the agencies and the processes by which the actors who use this kind of a power and how our dynamics are completely transformed as a result and therefore that there are larger harms which are created larger harms from which it is difficult to recover and i see the potential of this being applied to several parts of the country as well as the world because there is such a lot of faith which is being expressed in public private partnerships in the uh, state facilitating the market uh, and when we say facilitation you talk of a or you envisage a balanced role of the state uh, balancing between multiple actors but clearly this facilitation is like a one way street so and therefore i think it is these actions which perhaps also need to be exposed uh, and i think ki that is the comparative dimension which structural violence actually brings in it focuses i think uh, clear attention on the undue nature and the avoidable nature of harms thanks samita over to you mustafa uh, uh seth mehmet like folks you want to like, jump in or shall i continue how, how would you like me to go you can start and then we'll yeah, you just can. jump in yeah yeah okay yeah. just a few things uh like one of the things that i think the structural violence uh is like we were in the case of uh turkey like we were expecting structural violence to come to an end but it didn't right apparently it's a sustainable exercise or a <laughs> How come it becomes sustainable? Well, I mean, there's an end to like inflating urban rent, right? There's an end to speculation, but somehow it didn't bring in this whole collapse. So, well, from the view of the policymaker, yes, I mean, it's it's not sustainable, but from the view of broader public, people who still raise a demand for housing, right, in an asset-based economy and welfare system. I mean, what is the, from the view of quote unquote, the ordinary citizens, the entrepreneurs, like what is the psychology of urbanization here or the psychology of structural violence? Because once it's something, right, that is, that's a psychological phenomena, it's internalized. How are the ordinary quote unquote, the citizens, the denizens, urban denizens, like they internalize that structural violence? That was like part of the, the, at least what we had in mind, right? When we had started the project, but for various reasons, then because of this pandemic, like we were not able to study that aspect of the story. So we were able to read the story from the view of the policymakers, but we also were planning to study the ordinary citizens and the house owners and so forth. So that remained incomplete, but like today, as far as I, like I see that, it's even more than important than uh, the last few years now. There is a need to study uh, from the view of the ordinary citizens, but also the psychology of structural violence and how it's internalized. Uh, that's one thing. The second one is, I think we should pay more attention to this question of more than neoliberal states. And as far as I see, uh, that this kind of creation of uncertainty is a conscious strategy being used, right? There's a recent case in the case of Turkey, right? They they passed this new urban amendment to the urban transformation law that kind of allows the government to just declare any given area like a formal housing with formal title deeds as a transformation area and without asking for the permission of the landowners and title deed holders. And they have only a month uh, given to leave their apartments was this area is declared and that could be like downtown areas the most mm -hmm. uh, very highest rent is ever possible the oldest parts of town the whole bosphorus region of istanbul right where billions of dollars worth like housing estates you can just clear them as you want and no one can say no like this is like structural violence at its finest and it's taking new form and it takes it kind of unfolds up by taking directly on the principle of private property not establishing private property, but directly attacking the principle of private property. So I think this is where we should, I think, uh, further look at uh, this question of private property and more than neoliberal state. Um, uh, and this, I find the idea of this local citizenship and urban citizenship. 
And I'm not talking about this local or urban citizenship of Holston and insurgent citizenship, but how it's this whole urbanization regime is part of a broader arrangement where you also might want to look at uh, how it kind of fits into or works against the health policies, the education policies, the social security policies, and so forth. So how is urbanization is shaping other components or elements of broader welfare system and arrangement that also deserves some further attention too, I think. Uh, and and I would like to just finish that, that we had this citation to, to Sapana, Sapana Doshi, right? Where she goes, battles over urban space, citizenship and welfare characterize the program and political success of the AKP, just as in the case of India. I think that's the most common thing uh, and issue. Uh, thank you. I think that's all I have to say. I think we have used like two minutes, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So quickly, uh, there is a question waiting for us in the chat. Uh, I'll just read that out and then I think we'll open it for anyone here. Uh, maybe others from the team, Ankara too, uh, if, they, if they find it relevant. So the question is, can we therefore say that programs like Smart Cities Mission aid in the structural violence, especially in the light of evictions or clearing of urban poor in the background of the G20 summit? And I think it speaks to both the reflections uh, in different ways. So whoever wants to go for this, Amita, Set, uh, Mehmet. Mehmet, yeah. I'll just respond yeah. quickly, uh, saying that, let's see, the interesting part is that in Mumbai, there are one of the strategies that uh, has been adopted and which enhances the impact of the structural violence via slum redevelopment is really to not allow any other scheme to come into the city. Uh, and this includes even the smart city. Uh, uh, so several other housing options which may have led some way for alternate imaginations of where and how an informal settlement can develop are two. own way of consulting people, etc, etc. Mumbai today has no longer any need for these kind of small to put to grants which will come from the central government. So keeping smart cities away perhaps is the smart thing uh, that is done by governments like Mumbai. Uh, ideally, yes, I agree that it could aid structural violence, but in the case of Mumbai, it doesn't seem to be directly applicable. Uh, what well, yeah yeah one point to add uh, such concepts uh, smart city for example in the case of Turkish cities these uh, visionary new neoliberal concepts of urban restructuring mostly used to uh, make huge especially infrastructure investments uh, which benefits the powerful not the powerless people so um we should uh, interrogate the basis of such uh, policies and also we should ask whose smart city, which city, by smart, what we define. For example, uh, after Mustafa's uh, uh, recent answer, I would like also add one another point. Uh, for example, earthquake, the recent earthquake in Turkey, is such, this earthquake is used to uh, justify some entrepreneurial urban policies and probably it will accelerate urban transformation process because they initiate a new law. They try to initiate a new law. Uh, just, just that uh, currently. Thank you. Seth, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just briefly, I think I would approach it differently. I think I would say um, not whether this is or is not simply an example of structural violence, but rather in the case of smart cities or in any intervention that you're looking at, 
I think the trick is to show how the, a range of different um, uh, types of violence are used and structural violence is one of those. And then look for how in that particular configuration um, it, it, it's used alongside other types of violence. So there are similarities. Smart cities present you with a hegemonic vision of the future of a, of a future city, right? And there's more or less buy-in. Um, the benefits are distributed more or 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 less widely. Um, and and so there is an ele element of this, yeah, this vision that is well. I mean, in Turkey, I always thought Turkey was the um, kind of canary in the coal mine because the vision was um, tech savvy, modern, religious, ethno nationalist, um, and and this was going to be delivered through a specific type of urban transformation. And so I think the trick is then to connect the transformation of space to a hegemonic vision and see what type of power is being leveraged in order to secure that. Is it some sort of naked power with bulldozers that just raise a place or is it a future promise that you can get people to buy into? Yeah. Um, and I think it's probably most instances, in most instances, it's a combination, but the balance changes over time. And then maybe the final thing I'll say is I found it very interesting that Amita talks about four phases that she identifies starting in the early 90s. Uh, our paper also begins in the early 1990s, and we show how over time the balance of uh, of, of that kind of, um, of of power, right? So sometimes there's more structural power, sometimes just, just more direct application of, of violence um, changes over time. Thank you. We have two questions that have come up in the chat box and maybe uh, whoever wants can take them. We have a question from Deepa who said, thank you to the speakers for very interesting talks. I want to know if states have been involved in creating equity in housing. Are there examples of this? Is there a chance that because of this cities may be more well-contained and livable? May I and just we have a question here? from Ranj, sorry? May I just jump in here like for Deepa's question or? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Well, in the case of uh, Turkey, uh, we have here Mass Housing Agency, like Toplu Konut Idaresi, whose responsibility is to produce cheap housing, affordable housing. Also, like serves as a kind of a like arms length agency of the government. But the, here, the thing is that it about like one quarter of the housing units produced by this uh, agency was only for the, the lower middle income groups and they were mostly in other cities not in uh in, in major metropolitan centers so it was uh, like to deliver really to the pro uh, to the to its constituency in the conservative cities but in 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 ankara for instance such toki projects like they were really slow and the landowners like they avoided such projects because it was central government was directly uh, involved and was giving them less. So they prefer to either like a deal with the municipality or, or directly avoid the municipality and avoid comprehensive projects and try to get into one-to-one -to -one contact with the developers. So even if the government started to in introduce such projects, it the, the, the landowners didn't like that idea. Mm -hmm. So they, they didn't really work. Uh, I, I, at, at least I can say that to uh, as a response to Deepa's question. And the one final thing, one of the interviews was from the, it was uh, Mr. the mayor's, Melik uh, like right-hand man, like who worked with him like for like a quarter century. And he said like, from now on the next mayor, he, he goes, the next mayor should be doing really some restorative work. We'll try to like bring the city together and turn it into a livable one and in improve the standards of living in the city, right? So they really didn't care about the standards, and it was a he, he labeled it like maquillage, in, using the French term, like to make up, like bring a beautiful face to the city. That's it. That's what he said. Like he was the right hand man of Gökçek for a quarter century and gave shape to Ankara. This was what he was saying, very literally. Right, he said we need only makeup for the city and to make it more comfortable to live in. That's it. So they really did, were not really concerned with uh, equality or equality stuff of that sort, at least. 
it's maybe worth saying, I mean, from my impression uh, of Ankara, some of these spaces, if you're familiar with it, there's like um, a teleferico um, that you yeah. might have seen, like in Medellin, where you can just get a really interesting bird's eye view of some of the areas that were redeveloped. And um, from there, you can really see the different, the urban fabric. So you, you if you're with uh, Mustafa and Mehmet, they can tell you this area was built in the 50s, this area was built in the 70s, this area is from the 90s and so on. And you can really see that in, from the built environment. And some of these developments, yeah, they look quite nice. I mean, to answer the question, I'm sure the owners of those uh, um, are, are, yeah, financially they've been rewarded. The, the problem is that this is a very small minority. So as Mustafa says, it's this kind of, he called it a Ponzi scheme, which I think, I think is great. Some people have to win, right, in order to create this politics of hope and and in order to to kind of maintain this hegemonic vision. So, sure, some areas to answer the question very simply. Um, what, what was the wording from from Deepa? Um, there are examples of well-contained neighborhoods li that are livable and that have um, generated uh, assets for for their owners, but they're relatively small and a small number of people can can take advantage of those one point maybe i can add um in our paper in our article we uh, we argue that the how ankara case is scaled up and the uh, municipality experience of minik gökçek that led this experience and it become a nationwide regime of urbanization but uh, we should also think, as regarding the case of Turkey, we should also think the conflicts, the political conflicts between the central and local governments, especially when I see the Ranjani's question, he, he asks he has, uh, different levels of political decision-making and its role on also the structure of violence. For example, I live in Izmir. Izmir, uh, the local governments in Izmir controlled by Republican People's Party. But the central party, as you know, is controlled by Justice and Democracy Party. Uh, if uh, if such a uh, political uh, when we see such a political medium, the uh, struggle and conflicts between different uh, political parties uh, influences urban governance regimes, urban governance practices, mm -hmm. which also uh, significantly influence the violence. Uh, we should also. Uh, I, I think it's also important. Thank you very much. Can I come in for a bit? Uh, that's yeah, that's sure. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So just a small reflection. And one, I think, is I, I do not even dare to use the word equity anywhere uh, in terms of the kind of trajectories that one is seeing currently. Okay. Uh, but what I see is attempts to be included in two forms. Number one, the initiatives taken by certain state governments like the Odisha state government, which is at least trying to secure the land rights of uh, uh, informal settlers in several of their smaller towns and uh, hopefully uh, in Bhuvaneshwar uh, with a question that the second trajectory is in the form of growing resistances. Uh, and here I'm tempted to just give an example. Increasingly informal settlers are also extremely conscious of the kind of possibilities that these kind of negotiations and their place within the real estate market. Now, this is not so true of all zones, but there are pockets. Which, where this is available. And for example, if you think about the airport settlers, uh, those who are settled on airport land, or those who are settled in Dharavi, they know the importance of these projects. And therefore, the possibility of arguing uh, and for higher areas, um, uh, living areas, for better infrastructures, is something which is present in some of these politics. But at the same time, this kind of politics also remains very, very vulnerable to uh, all kinds of maneuvering and co-option. Uh, so it's a very slippery kind of a road uh, when, it, when it comes to resistance. 
because who doesn't dream of a house who doesn't dream of having a address but at the same time there are lots of harms which are also embedded within that the second part of the question i think which rajni has asked is in terms of the levels of government and i think in the indian case uh, it has always been the state governments really who have tried to uh, push ahead uh, housing policies and the interesting part of today is that how a federal government agenda of formalizing housing through four verticals through a project like the pantapratan avas yojana which offers two ranges of possibilities one a possibility of upgradation etc and the other is a possibility of formal housing through redevelopment and to me it is very interesting to see that uh, uh, while on one hand there is a lot of uptake of upgradation program that is something that one is seeing on ground there are several state governments which are extremely reluctant to go towards these upgradation programs and are trying to push ahead read we seem to have lost kamita extremely high prices of property so we briefly lost you amita but uh, i think we got you at the end so i think we thanks <laughs> okay uh, yeah it also struck me all the comments so far uh, that we are uh, what has come come through in 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 the presentations and the comments is i think two three things which are worth uh, keeping in mind when which all of us have i think uh, seen in our in the work on sexual violence a is the long kind of trajectory of settle of you know initiation settling fruition and then the the overall sustainability as uh, mustafa put it Uh, of structural violence i think that whole the temporality of that violence um, and and it's uh, it's playing out is very important also what was very interesting is that the point about diversity that emerges the diversity of context the diversity also of the uh, you might say recipients of of structural violence um is something that perhaps needs specific attention because out of that uh, building on what you said amita there is the possibility of seeing some leverage uh, of finding leverage to counter structural violence in in different ways as maybe people in dara we are doing are trying um so of course as you correctly point out there is it is a slippery slope it's not uh, as if you have firm purchase um yeah so there are some reflections that came to mind i have a um, actually uh, a very quick question to put to whoever wants to ta- take it up i mean one of the things that the special feature also tried to focus on is really to think a little bit more about methodologies um and particularly because structural violence is quite a difficult concept to study um and i think this is something so it would really help i think maybe um uh, those of us those of you in the audience to hear a little bit from the panelists about you know the importance of new and appropriate methodologies for studying structural violence also how you dealt with it and any particular challenges you might have faced does the ankara team want to go first go ahead yeah yeah <laughs> the the, uh, the uh, i don't know if there's any methodological innovation here as such uh but i think one of the things here is to decipher right to look at the mechanism how structural violence is operationalized its governance right and there we we try to like map out the key players of structural violence right so here i mean 
uh, how how different is that from studying any given urban regime? Mm -hmm. Well, to a certain degree, it is not, but to a certain degree, it is. And this is where you begin to also expand and begin to work on not only the discourses, but quote unquote the moral basis and the framing of urban rent and the regime. In other words, how they give meaning to, ascribe meaning to this very idea of the urban and the urbanization, right? And the second one was, well, in fact, this is like, that was one of the main premises of our paper, but it remained underdeveloped here because we had a second part, a follow-up paper for this one. But unfortunately, as I have said, we were not able to pursue that second half of the project seeing how this was pursued by the real players, right? Who were drafted into the game. In other words, remember I mentioned the psychology, right? Mm -hmm. So we were trying to look at the interface between the supply and demand. So methodologically speaking, we were not only talking about quote-unquote or seeing urbanization as a state-led process it didn't mean that it was a top-down or supply-side project, right? It's quote unquote a bottom up. It's a it might have it might look like a top down designed regime, but it it has kind of transformed a bottom up demand for urbanization into a top down scheme, right? So we did not like start with it or do on a supply side story. In fact, it's a demand side story being organized into a supply side one. So we turned inside out the division between the supply side and the demand side. So that's another like an epistemological, but also ontological uh, different uh, a contribution of our, or at least in terms at, at the level of pro promise and premise, right? But it, it well, we, we still have some much work to do there, but also the, the point, thing, the, uh, Amita's point on, right? The question of the alienation, but somehow this system kept people away from alienation. Right. Uh, it's it's about it's a long story. I will just stop here. I think Seth has something to say. Go on, Seth. I just want to add. I, I think for for me it was useful because it was very much um con more of a conceptual innovation for for us. So my understanding of structural violence was very pedestrian until I read uh, Galtung, which I had never read before. I mean, I had what I thought was a basic understanding, and in fact, it was far more complex. Um. The text. So I think, you know, we kind of were struggling to conceptualize. We were doing a kind of standard, I would say, critical urban analysis, which was primarily political economy. Um, and when we thought about hegemony, we were looking at simply coercion and persuasion. And I think structural violence helped us add more complexity to that because we we can't say that people were fully persuaded, but they weren't fully coerced either into participating in in this regime. And so I think it. Uh, it was more of a conceptual tool that we used, having already done most of the data collection. Yes, and also allows us to like see how coercion and consent are interlinked, really, in practice. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. allows us to overcome such quote unquote like binarisms too. Sure. Uh, I think we're out Mehmet, of time. I was about to say maybe just a very quick response, Mehmet and Amita. Uh, you're just, very brief. We're already a little out of time. Uh, I will, uh, Amit, I can continue. No problem. No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, okay, okay. At first sight, it seems that there are two methodological dimensions. Firstly, for example, if we are going to research urban poor, uh, excluded groups, evicted populations, suffered from an, an urban transformation project, it seems it requires a bottom-up methodological perspective. On the other hand, if you are going to research investors, uh, top level bureaucrats or some politicians, influential politicians uh, get, uh, for example, more formal methodologies, some focus group meetings, some formal uh, interviews, etc. Uh, can work. Uh, but there is a need to fuse these two methodologies. For example, if you are going to research, as Mustafa said, the relation between the supply and demand. For example, how a a, a people a, a gecekondu settler became a contractor. Uh, 
a small scale on contractor and become an agent of urban entrepreneurialism. This requires, I think, an anthropological perspective in urban studies, how he became such an actor. So uh, maybe in the future we can uh, carry out such further research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amita? Okay. So I think thanks for that interesting question, Lalita. And I think the concept of structural violence for me uh, as a, what I would describe as a scholar activist with my engagements with housing struggles in Mumbai. Uh, a, I think it pushed one to look at temporality. The second thing I think in methodology, it made one look at both literature and the concepts which are linked to what is exactly happening both. I think I, I would not put it as a demand and supply kind of a thing. But to me, the critical question has been okay, how does one produce the kind of silence that has surrounded uh, the uh, perpetuation of this kind of a regime which actually seems to uh, worsen things in many ways uh, for a large section of society. It gives houses to a few but there also the quality of housing uh, the kind of tension around this. But I think the perplexing part is this silence and how does one investigate into that silence. And that, I think, is only possible when you begin to look at cases over a much longer period of time uh, and uh, engage with uh, some of the uh, struggles. That's it. Thank you so much. I think uh, that brings us to the end. We're already a little bit over time. Um, maybe I can just say a very uh, warm and heartfelt thank you to all the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank thank you, you very much thank to the you for IIHS making team. us a part of it. Thank you to the IIHS team of Tanvi, Vikas and Pragna. Thank you so much for inviting us and giving us this platform. Thank you, folks. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.